I call to order the April 11th, 2022 Hennepin County Board of Public Education Board meeting. Um, first things first, I would like to invite the North Henderson High School Air Force JROTC uh, with Colonel Eric Runquist down to present the colors. Everyone, would you please rise? You may be seated. Once again, that was the North Henderson High School Air Force JROTC. I'm a little rusty. We have not done that in two years, and I'm glad they are back. Thank you. All right, first things first is uh, an agenda approval. I'll uh, take a motion to approve the agenda. I move we approve the agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Agenda is approved. First up is Dr. Wendy Fry with our program highlight. Welcome, Dr. Fry. bring to you the wonderful news that all of our high schools are fully accredited through 2027. All six of them. Now for the details. Perhaps, there we go. Had a little delay. Okay, so um, five of our schools were accredited by the State Board of Education. DPI has a new process for accreditation. East Hendersonville, the early college north and west were accredited through DPI at their um, most recent meeting. This was a one-time cost of $1,840 per school for the total that you see here. As a note, our previous accreditation process through Cognia cost $109,000, $109, thousand two hundred dollars over the past five years for a significant cost savings one of our schools the career academy did not qualify under the state's model so we did use cognia for this process and i'm pleased to tell you it was a much more thorough look at our schools than was our previous experience and want to spend the bulk of the time, uh, the rest of my time to share with you uh, the findings from that review. You see the engagement fee review, 1000, and then the yearly fee through 2027, a considerable cost savings to the district. This is the report given to us by Dr. Barbara Johnson. She requested our school. She is a lead evaluator with the with Cognia. And when she saw and when she read a little bit about the Career Academy and what it is we seek to do, she requested to be our lead evaluator. And I think I speak on behalf of uh, Principal Auten who is here with me this evening that we thoroughly enjoyed getting to know her 
and uh, reading her uh, report that she shared with us at the end. I want to give you some of the highlights though. These slides are a little bit about Cognia and the role. Um, these findings I think will confirm to you that we are accomplishing or on the road to accomplishing all those wonderful things that we seek to do at the Career Academy. I won't read all the slides to you, but first of all, this one, the day after graduation focus, they recognized that our teachers and our staff were truly invested in the student and what they would do, not only while they were with us, but after they left us. You'll see that some of her notes here, those targeted pathways that we worked so hard to create and implement, the JAG opportunity, Jobs for America's graduates, those high yield instructional strategies that we emphasize in all of our schools. And then as you know, all of the support services at Career Academy that wrap their arms around our students. More strengths that were noted, meeting the students where they are, socially, emotionally, and academically, an individualized approach to education. So there was one area that they recommended we improve. They said, while we see that you are using data to inform decisions, we'd like for you to document and formalize that process so, that's, so that there's a historical record of how you're using data to drive decisions that you're making. And um, we very much will embrace that feedback. <coughs> In fact, that's something I, I plan to share with all of our schools to make sure that we're doing that everywhere. Another area of strength was professional growth. Uh, you know in Henderson County that we have targeted walkthroughs of all of our schools, instructional rounds, we have instructional coaches to mentor new teachers, and then we have the grant that I've shared with you previously, the IPG, Innovative Partnership Grant Funds, and uh, they recognize that as an area of strength. Also, that we are committed to the mission and the purpose of the school, and we emphasize character development and relationships between staff and students. In conclusion, I especially enjoyed reading these quotes that they took from stakeholders that they interviewed, uh, parents, students, our Blue Ridge Community College partners, and these are three of the quotes that uh, she decided to share with us in this report. The school caters to the individual student, molding the curriculum to what each student needs. It's like a mixing pot that blends well. Lots of diversity, but cohesive and accepting. And the culture is now right. The right balance between administration, kids, and teachers has been found. So I'm pleased to tell you that the report, the larger report, came to us at the end of last week. We have it, and it goes into greater detail about the findings of the school. Um, but I have to tell you, I would be remiss if I did not share with you that um, Ms. Auten has brought um, such magic and um, personableness to that environment. And I've invited her to be with me tonight. Um, and Ms. Otten, if you'll step on up and just ask her to say a few words about um, her involvement and her staff's involvement because it truly was a heavy, heavy lift. So thank you, Ms. Otten. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Um, it was actually, I learned a lot. It was fun to take a deep dive into all the data from the time that I wasn't there. So, you know, the three and a half years before I came, looking at where we were and where we are now and how we've grown and then using the feedback they give us a lot of really good feedback in the um, the full report on how we can get better and what we can do to get better so it was it was a i don't want to say a fun experience but it really was because of what we got to learn so thank you absolutely thank you, thank you. and i'll be happy to answer any questions you may have about the process at this time well, I tell you, uh, myself and, and Mrs. Holt and, and Dr. Revis were a part of this process on a Sunday afternoon doing the interview, and I was late. And I just want to thank <laughs> Dr. Revis for being there because um, she is a superstar in this area, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, being part of that. Mm. Any questions for 
Dr. Fry? I'd just like to make sure that the board realized that Dr. Fry saved us $90,000. Did everybody see that part? That's yeah. incredible. Meaningful. Saw that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I just want to ask a question about the state accreditation because I'm not familiar with that. How, um, when we're accredited with the state, is that a, a lifelong accreditation or do we have to undergo reviews? Because one of the good things about Cognia, and I know 90000 is a lot of, mo of money. I, I get all that. But there is nothing like having an external review committee come into your school and do a thorough dive with a fresh set of eyes on your data and in the culture of your school. So I just wondered, mm -hmm. you know, what is that process similar and how long does the accreditation last? So the accreditation window is exactly the same. It's a five year okay. window. Um, but we were concerned, as you um, asked me about early on in this process, well, what about our middle schools and our elementary schools, you know, because it's a healthy process, it is. even though it, 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 every piece of it's not fun. No. Um, it certainly is a growth experience. So what we are doing right now, even um, as, as soon as, as today, even, but we are investigating options. Um, to have teams, there are a couple of different routes we can go to have an external team come in and take a look at our middle and elementary schools. And what we also want to include that the Cognia process doesn't include is having our own administrators and teachers be part of those visits to each school because that's excellent professional development in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Do our middle schools, do they still do those uh, middle schools to watch? They certainly do. That's, that's sure a do. really good process as well. Yes, ma'am, it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. The only question I have is, is DPI now is the one that accredits the rest of the schools, correct? Um, you, may cho you may choose to go the DPI route and more and more districts as they're coming up for renewal are choosing to do so. But why not the Career Academy? Why, won't they do, why aren't they accrediting career academies yet? You have to meet certain metrics on your school report card, and graduation rate is something that we have con continued to pay attention to, to work to increase. The graduation rate at Career Academy, like many other alternative models across the state, is not yet to the threshold that would qualify for the DPI model. What is their threshold? I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I can make that available to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you all. Next up is going to be Dr. John Bryant with a few recognitions today. Thank you, Mr. Craven and members of the board. Um, it really is a pleasure to uh, take a moment to recognize and celebrate a couple of people. But before I do that, I really want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the men and women who serve in our community who were part of our efforts last Thursday. Uh, as this board is well aware and the community is likely well aware, we had to respond to a bomb threat on the campuses of North Henderson High School and Apple Valley Middle School. And while those are days that you don't want to have to live, when you have a community like ours, you realize how special Henderson County is. The responsiveness of our teachers, of our staff, of our school leaders, of our sheriff's department, of our emergency management services, of our local fire departments, and all of the men and women who stepped up and stepped out to make sure that our school communities were safe and well taken care of, we cannot speak highly enough of them. Uh, we frequently say Henderson County is special because of the people that live, work, and serve here, and it was on full display last Thursday. And again, um, as the representative of the school system that gets to see it from the front row seat, I just want to say how thankful we are to each and every one of them for their care and concern for our community. The leadership of our emergency responders uh, simply cannot be overstated, and I just wanted to share that on behalf of the board. Thank you for allowing me to do so. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Mr. Rick Fender, who loves to be the center of attention, to come and stand next to me rather than sitting, sitting in his seat while I talk about him. And as Mr. Fender's coming over here, he shared a little uh, Rick Fender fun fact with me moments ago. Uh, Mr. Fender is retiring at the end of this month. Um, after many exceptional years of service. In fact, we joined the school system at the same time in 2006. Uh, I heard Rick Fender was going to be here, and I applied immediately. That is a, <laughs> exactly why I sent my information in. But Mr. Fender has attended 200, over 200, right 200 board meetings. 
And this is his last one. And uh, I tell you, and so there, there is certainly some celebration on behalf, but really the celebration is Lynn Fender. Lynn's here a moment. Where's, there's Lynn. She's in the middle right now. Lynn's about to get her husband back. You know what I mean? On, on Monday nights, he'll be cooking dinner for you, whatever it is that you'd like um, in that way. But here's, here's some things that I'd like to share on behalf of Rick Fender. Rick Fender has led our technology department with a level of professionalism that really just doesn't exist in the world today. He's one of those people that is first class, first rate, and so respectful in every avenue and in every space. He has actually sat around the leadership room table with four superintendents in Henderson County Public Schools, and he made every one of them look good. He made every one of them better because of his leadership of our technology department. And he actually oversaw it at a time when it was transforming at a rate that almost is hard to imagine. When you think about when he first began service, when we start talking about digital devices, we might have been in the single thousands. Now we're in the tens of thousands of device. Leading blended learning and instructional leadership and really the melding of how we teach and how we learn, not just as an infrastructure, but as a way we serve students. And if it ever was a point where you say, like, how ready were we as a school system, our readiness in March of 2020 really was a showcase. Some school systems needed three or four weeks to flip to a blended learning model, to a digital learning model. We did it in three days. Three days. But that doesn't happen without the leadership of people like this who simply handle it. And if I could give Rick a compliment outside of what an extraordinary human being he is, he's one of those people that makes you want to be like a better man. He's one of those people that makes you want to be a better father, a better husband, a better community member because of who he is, his faith on full display in each and every action in his space. He is the most efficient person I've ever met. I kid you not. Oftentimes Rick is fixing something when you're finishing the sentence. You're saying, here's what we need to do, and he's making sure that that happens. And as someone who really admires this in people, you only have to have to say it to Mr. Fender once. You don't have to say it twice. You don't have to ask him again or send him a reminder. He's making sure that it happens on a daily basis every day. Our school system for the past 16 years has been its level of excellence in no small part because of who Rick Fender is and what he has represented in that way. And this board and previous boards have been served so very well by him. Um, and when I think about how fortunate we are to call him a friend and call him a colleague and to sit around that table, to see that wry smile that you just saw there, uh, to often joke about how, how, how much he wants to be at this microphone, but I won't give it to him. Um, Rick, Rick is the kind of man that we love and cherish and we are grateful, grateful, grateful serves in public education. And so on behalf of the board, we are certainly celebrating his retirement, his well-deserved service to public education and beyond. We will be gifting him with a beautiful commemorative clock that is in that box. And we didn't take it out because we knew if we took it out, we couldn't get it back in. It, it's one of those, we're going to let you take it out of that box one time uh, together. But it really is an honor as the superintendent, and I say on behalf of every member of the leadership team, um, we don't just appreciate Rick, we love him. We love him as a friend, we love him as a colleague, and we love him as a public educator. And it certainly is an honor to celebrate his retirement and celebrate him here today. Let's give Rick Fender a round of applause. What's yours name? Oh, look, he's pulling out some paper. <laughs> One last chance. <laughs> I am incredibly humbled um, by John's words. I'm not sure I'm deserving of all those kind things he said, but thank you, Dr. Brown, much appreciated. I do want to thank you, board members, for your kindness, your trust, and your support. I consider the last 15 and a half years here around that leadership table as truly one of the biggest blessings of my life. Not because it's been easy, but because of the family atmosphere that exists here in Henderson County. I'd like to publicly thank my wife, Lynn, uh, who's here with me tonight, and my daughters, Sierra and Mariah, who have loved and supported me on the good and not so good days uh, when I get home from work. And to my awesome technology team, words can't express the appreciation I have for you. 
Thank you for always being there to take on whatever challenges that got thrown our way. And finally, to this leadership team, you are more than fellow team members. You are family, and I love each one of you. Thank you. Great. You can come down. Where'd Molly go? Molly, do you mind getting a picture? We're going to take a picture with your box. Come in. Mr. Rhodes thinks this box is empty, but there is something in this box. That's exactly right. Yeah, That's there's exactly something right. in there. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. very much. Yeah, and I just wanted to say a couple things to you, Rick. I, I, listen, these last two years have been rough on us, right? And um, we came to you on a Friday, I believe, or maybe it was a Thursday, and said, you know what? On Monday, <laughs> we need to have a device in every kid's hands, and we need to have the bandwidth to be able to put our teachers in every single school into their homes. Um, and you remember what our boardroom looked before this and how we were trying to broadcast with a <laughs> seemingly an iPhone and a tripod sitting there. And, and I've only been here six years, but you've done a heck of a job and we're sure gonna miss you. And so I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. So very good. Yes, sir. And then uh, Dr. Bryant, we have one more. Yes, sir, we do. Yes, sir, we do. And she's gonna tell me whether or not she's gotta to continue to take notes while I talk about it. I worked that out. What's that, you'll take? I, I, I worked that out, we're okay. You worked it out, okay. Yeah. So come on over here for just one moment, please. I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Stephanie Alford to stand by my side again, as she has done uh, so very often. <laughs> Molly, use as many profanity words as you can while you're writing down, exactly. <laughs> just, just to make her to have to correct it all. No, <laughs> no it, it is at this time that I get to honor somebody who um, really has been by my side every step of the way. And uh, Stephanie Alfrey has been serving this school system in nearly every capacity. And on April 22nd, she's gonna be stepping into another phase of her career, one that we celebrate and honor for her. But what I want you to know about Stephanie is this. Stephanie started her service with the school system in a school. She was regularly present seeing that direct service to students. And then stepped into service in, as an administrative support in the front office and helped to coach and teach and guide our principals as everyone does who works inside an office space. And then she joined our central office team and worked in our instructional services supporting student services and in supporting Title I. Then she worked in our payroll department. And then she came to administrative services. <laughs> <laughs> and she regretted every day of that when she was in administrative. No, uh, Stephanie and I had the great pleasure of spending nearly five years in administrative services together. And it was at that time that I realized God had blessed me with someone who was going to make me better at my job every single day by the way that that person understood what our core mission was. And that was service to every child in every way, to do it better in that space. And somebody who could finish my sentences, somebody who knew what I was thinking, somebody who knew what the face meant when I didn't say a word. <laughs> but the person who really could give me like the grace and the patience to understand how we could work together in service to every student, every child under our care. And I was so very fortunate after that time in administrative services that we would step down the hallway together and begin to serve the Board of Education and serve the entire school system. And each a board member in this room now knows, as does the honor of our legal counsel, what an exceptional individual Stephanie Alfrey is. I talked about Mr. Fender's efficiency, rivaled only by the person who stands to my right. Somebody who often had to answer, anticipate, prepare, and serve everything that you might see in a job description and everything that isn't in a job description. But truly, an honor to know Stephanie, to call her a friend, and to have somebody who stood by me on those most challenging of days, who provided the encouragement and the guidance and the wisdom that only someone who shares an office with you can, because they see every bit of it every single day. 
And on April 22nd, when she finishes her service, we'll be presenting her with a very special gift on behalf of the board. But what we also know is, again, we are better because she was part of this school system. We are better because she's been a model of what it could be and what it should be and what we all should aspire to do. So I'm so very grateful to celebrate Stephanie today, her service to the Board of Education, her service to Henderson County Public Schools, and again, the fact that she has taken care of me for almost eight years. Uh, we are all very fortunate to have her. Let's celebrate Stephanie Alfrey, please. Yeah. So I will keep it very short because if I don't, I will cry. And as we all know, I still have a job to do. <laughs> and so I'm just going to say thank you all for the privilege it has been to work with Henderson County Public Schools. It's one of the toughest decisions to decide to do something else, but it has been a pleasure to work with all of these wonderful people from our leadership team to the board, to our principals, to every single person in our school system, from custodians to bus drivers. I've just, it has been a genuine pleasure to work with and serve alongside everybody. So thank you very much. Ms. Alfrey, being gluten-free as you are, I will miss you. <laughs> <laughs> you set us up. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I've got to say a few things. The, the job that you do is one of the toughest in the school. I, you deal with us, and there are a lot of different personalities here. And every two, year, two years, it changes. And you deal with John, and we all know how that is. And you have done a phenomenal job over this crazy time period that we have. And, and I truly appreciate it. And thank you for always having a pen for me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next up, uh, board chair observations. And I have a couple, but Dr. Bryant kind of went through them. Thursday, we had a, um, as all of you know, had a bomb scare, and we, we always have to take those very seriously, and they, and they use up uh, a tremendous amount of resources in our community from police and EMS and teachers and um, everyone else that's involved, and, and a lot of angst amongst our staff and our students, and especially our parents. Um, we're not they might not feel they're getting information as timely as um, they want that information. And there's a purpose um, behind the method behind what we do. But really the leadership team, you guys and Dr. Brian, y'all shine. I mean, th this is when you guys really stepped up and, and, and um, the job that you do and the assistant principals and the principals and the, and the staff at North Henderson, y'all knocked it out of the park. And, and I truly appreciate that. And I knew, when I got that call at 7.30 or whatever it was, Thursday morning, I knew you guys had it. And um, I have a lot of faith in, in you folks, and so thank you. Um, but also, I want to thank Sheriff Lowell Griffin um, and his crew. They, I mean, they are, they did everything that we could ask and more. Um, and his leadership and his team does a phenomenal job in, in our SROs that we have in our schools. Um, the North SRO, Apple Valley SRO did a phenomenal job in that situation. And Jimmy Brissy, bless you, um, who heads our emergency services division, um, kind of put everything together for us. And um, I really, really want to thank you guys for having 2,000 kids, which is how many kids we, that's the largest campus we have in Henderson County. We've got a middle school and we've got a high school. 2,000 people uh, reunified with their parents, um, sent home in their buses, um, got gone by the, you know, sent them home by their cars, and I just want to thank you all for, for everything that you did in that particular situation. So thank you guys. Um, board member observations. Ditto. Case. Anyone? All right. Let me move on. Next up, we're going to do some public comments. We have three today, so we're going to do three minutes um, for each public comment. And our first, who we've not heard from in quite a while, so welcome back, Mr. Chris Walters. <laughs> Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, one of the jobs I I've taken on as a citizen is to defend and protect the public school system. Uh, I remember the first day I, after my official retirement, I had a two-hour meeting with Rick Wood and went over all my points in, for two hours. 
And uh, I think the first public, public uh, the first uh, school board meeting after I retired, I came and spoke. And I've been here many times to speak on those issues. Um, so a free and prosperous country depends on strong institutions and public school systems here and across the country are absolutely essential for the stability for maintaining a free and prosperous country. And that's a concern of mine um, from a political point of view and other ways. But, but really what I want to do tonight is thank everybody, regardless of how our political views differ, for the miraculous job, valiant job you've done in the last two years of keeping things together. It's unprecedented stress and division. Uh, I've been to a lot of meetings where there have been people out the, outside and all around, and I, 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 w I wasn't a teacher during this time, but I sincerely appreciate everything the staff, teachers, and school board members have done uh, to keep things going, to keep things together. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that times like this, families and kids depend on coming into a public school system for their teachers, the classroom, for stability. And uh, we, we don't really, I never realized that until I became a teacher, how important that is. So the stability re you provided for everybody, regardless of our, our uh, disagreements about things, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that and how valuable that has been. And I think it's probably been a good example for school systems across the state. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Indian Jackson. Welcome, Ms. Jackson. Thank you. Okay, so um, I want to first, um, Mr. Craven, I called you Blair last time. You all don't know, he went to school with my brother. That's why I called you Blair. But I want to address you as Mr. Craven, and I, it's been killing me for a month. So I waited okay. a whole month it's, to call you Mr. Craven, don't right? Don't stress that. <laughs> all right, so, um, but anyways. Oh, too long. So, um, oh, God, my bad. Um, so, did you know Hendersonville is celebrating 175 years this year? Y'all know that? Did you know that the first tax paid for Henderson County was on a 14-year-old slave girl? Did y'all know that? I don't think that we talk enough about that, um, about the other side of our history here. Um, just imagine being the first to contribute to what Hendersonville is today, and nobody knows about you. Don't know your name, don't know when you died, don't know which slave owner owned her, which by the way, I wanna um, encourage you all to visit hendersonheritage.com. It's hendersonheritage.com. Um, it's a website. It has a list of all of the slave owners that came out of Hendersonville. That, that's just one of the um, interesting facts on that website. Um, it was amazing reading this list because as I was reading the names, I came across Gash, Miller, Rudisil, Mackey, Fletcher, King, Clayton, Edney, Orr, Mills, Allen, Murray, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We all know these names. We all know someone who's connected these names. Um, it, it really touched me when Mr. Fender said um, we're family, because, I mean, like, honestly, like, we're so connected in so many ways that, that we just don't even realize it. Um, if we knew these things about uh, the different, even the different names of the slave owners and how they connect to the, the people who attend the schools up to today, we could learn a little more about ourselves and come together more. Um, yeah, just imagine the power that this county could have if our children who are the future of this county you know, knew our history and are able to take that to another level um, as a family. You know, um, I'm fine coming here every month to try to convince you all, but I know that um, we spoke with a school board member last year and we were advised that um, that critical race theory would be addressed this year. Uh, so we're still waiting and hoping that happens. And, you know, it's just time for us to take this conversation out of these meetings and into the room's where it happened. The room where it happened. You know that song? Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's really all I want to say. Uh, I got 10 seconds. Next time, my son is going to come here, and he's going to talk about school lunch. And I cannot wait, because could you imagine eating pizza and milk for lunch? 
That's all I got to say. Y'all have a good one, though. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, next up is going to be Joe Elliott. Welcome, Mr. Elliott. Thank you. Good afternoon. It seems that almost every school district in the country is under siege by critical race theory activists. It is amazing how quickly a concept that has been around for at least 30 years without evoking much mainstream interest has suddenly become the most recent point of attack in the war against our public schools. Even the most casual examination of the controversy strongly suggests that the talking points are remarkably similar in style and substance, almost as if a well-funded group is writing the scripts and training the actors. In truth, CRT is studied almost exclusively in graduate level programs and in law schools. It does not appear in the North Carolina K-12 social studies standards, nor does it have any discernible influence on the review, selection, and implementation of instructional materials used in social studies classes throughout North Carolina. In fact, the very public process used to select our instructional materials makes it very unlikely that CRT could have slipped into our schools unnoticed. Evaluation of these materials involves a broad cross-section of content specialists, classroom teachers, and parents, guided by the Department of Public Instruction standards. So what is the real substance of this manufactured hysteria? Referencing CRT, even though it has no relevance to our discussion of the K-12 curriculum in North Carolina, feels to me like an attempt to selectively edit our social studies curriculum to remove references to historical events that make some of us uncomfortable. Should we accept feeling of, a feeling of discomfort as an appropriate criterion for revising our social studies materials? What's next? Are we going to eliminate Shakespeare because the language is a little stilted? Or are we going to do away with math entirely because most of us, including me, struggle with the subject? What is most disturbing, we now have seen teachers accused of somehow aiding and abetting those who seek to make CRT a central outcome when teaching history. They have, already, they have already been several instances where teachers have lost their jobs as a result of these accusations. These are the same teachers who are our neighbors and friends, the same people who we see weekly at the grocery store and on Sunday next to us in church. These people work long hours at low pay that we have traditionally trusted to guard, nurture, and educate our children. How did they suddenly and without explanation become the enemy? Ironically, the attempt to censor critical parts of our history is a perfect definition of the term cancel culture. And I personally think we are being sold a CRT bill of goods. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. All right, next up, consent agenda. I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda. We're going to pull out a couple resolutions to um, read, though. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve consent? I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Uh, Mrs. Kasky. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, and it passes. Uh, first resolution is going to be the Teacher Appreciation Week. Would anybody like to read that? Ms. Case. Resolution honoring the observance. There you go. <laughs> I want to be heard. Resolution honoring the observance of Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week, May 2nd through, uh, through the 6th, 2022. Whereas, a strong, effective system of free public school education for all children is essential to our democratic system of government. And, whereas, Henderson County Public Schools is known as an outstanding school system with an effective, caring staff. And, whereas, all Henderson County Public School employees are members of a family working together to provide the best education possible for all our children. And whereas we constantly seek to provide our students with the latest advances in curriculum and technology, realizing that their futures are greatly determined by the, equal, by the quality of education they receive and Whereas, teachers not only teach, but they serve as counselors, mentors, 
motivators, nurses, and role models. And whereas teachers are able to perform their duties more effectively and successfully because of support and dedication of all staff members. And whereas it is appropriate that teachers and all staff be recognized for their dedication and commitment to the education of our students. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Henderson County Board of Public Education that May 2nd through 6th, 2022, shall be observed by Henderson County Public Schools as Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week, adopted this 11th day of April, 2022. Thank you, Ms. Case. And our last resolution is going to be School Library Month. Uh, Ms. Regolf? I get it. Thank you, sir. This resolution is honoring the observance of School Library Month, April 2022, whereas April 22, 2022 has been designated the 37th Annual National School Library Month by the American Association of School Librarians, and whereas the school library is to ensure that students and staff are effective users of ideas and information, and whereas school libraries provide materials that will develop liter literally literary, cultural, <laughs> and aesthetic appreciation, as well as ethical standards, and whereas school libraries provide materials to meet the individual needs, varied interests and abilities, socioeconomic backgrounds, and maturity levels of the students served, and whereas school librarians provide the leadership and expertise necessary to, to ensure that the school library is an integral part of the school's instructional program, and whereas school librarians serve students by teaching the skills of locating and using information through, through traditional resources and new technologies, providing, liter providing literature appreciation activities, and guiding and encouraging content and recreational reading. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Harris County Board of Public Education that April 2022 shall be observed by the Harris County Public Schools as School Library Month, and that is adopted this 11th day of April 2022. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. All right, next up, um, because it's still long, we vote on it every single month. Um, we're going to be talking about our current face covering guidance and policy. Um, combine that with our return to learn, um, and we'll go ahead and get this knocked out. Thank you, Mr. Craven and members of the board. And just as you stated, it is required that we do take up this issue as it relates to uh, Senate Bill 654 and each board's requirement to make a determination as to the face covering guidance at least once a month. What we see right here is data that continues to trend in exactly the direction we want to see it move. Uh, that number uh, is just near zero at the current point. And so working through what you've seen previously, the county's alert system report, which is another of those metrics, Again, you can see the new transmission data, the percent uh, inpatient, as well as the case rate per population of 100,000. Henderson County at this time is in the low level for community transmission rates. We are continuing our district dashboard and the information associated with it. We provide weekly notifications where they're necessary, but daily notifications on the website for those who are interested in it for those cases. And right now we're generally either seeing zero or one on any given day. As of February the 14th, per this board's decision, face coverings are optional for all students, staff, visitors when indoors and in all indoor settings in school properties. And per the updated guidance from the CDC, that became optional on February 25th on school buses. Finally, again, just a reminder, school affected notifications are not provided daily unless you are tracking the COVID dashboard, which is linked on our website. And then in the event of district notification requirements for clusters, we would do so as required by law. The North Carolina uh, Strong Schools Toolkit was last updated on February 10th. There have been no substantive changes since then. 654, as referenced now twice, requires that boards make a decision about the current policy at least once a month. And as we stand right now, this final slide, just our fluidity, our continuing to monitor the data, and we are. It's a recommendation of the leadership that that remain optional at this time. Questions, comments, concerns from the board? All right, I move that the Harris County Board of Public Education approve the continuation of the current face covering guidance as presented. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah, whoever. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes. Thank you. Next up, um, we're going to have Mr. Bernie Sosha and Mr. Anderson from uh, Carlin and Anderson. Um, uh, 
show us our 2020-2021 audit report. Gentlemen. All right. Um, I'm going to stay right here. I'll give okay. Mr. Uh, Anderson the podium. Um, most of you are familiar with um, Mr. Anderson. He's been coming here for several years now, and we are truly fortunate that he does. His firm does an outstanding job um, providing us with the audit services as well as supporting us throughout the rest of the, the year with situations as they may arise. And Mr. Anderson, I will turn the floor over to you to present your findings this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sosha. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to have me back today and for allowing our firm to conduct the audit of the board's financial records for the 2020-2021 year. I can remember how to do this. <laughs> what, I'd, what I'd like to do before I review the details of the report and the results for the year is to discuss the audit process and procedures that we perform. Then I'll review the results of the governmental funds, which include your local current expense or general fund, the state public school, other restricted individual school, federal grants, and capital outlay funds. Following that, I will highlight the results for the enterprise funds, which include the child nutrition and child care fund. And lastly, I will summarize the results of the audit. As mentioned in previous years, the accounting standards under which we are required to operate shifted to a risk-based approach. What auditors are required to do is to gain an understanding of the nature of the Board of Public Education's business operations and its environment. Because of this, our audit procedures are designed to analyze the Board's operations and the policies and procedures that are used in order to determine whether these processes are operating as intended. Part of this process is conducting interviews with the finance staff of the central office, but also interviewing other staff, both at the central office as well as at the individual schools in order to gain a better understanding of the internal controls and segregation duties that are in place. A key component of a risk-based audit approach is to look for fraud and the risk of fraud taking place. Part of these processes are the risk, fraud risk questionnaires that we issue to selected staff as well as to the board members. The board should be cognizant of where fraud risks are with the Board of Public Education and the steps that management takes to mitigate those risks. An auditor is not charged with the responsibility of finding fraud, but if any fraud is found or if the auditor believes that there is a risk of fraud taking place, then the auditor is required to discuss with the management and the board and to determine if additional audit procedures are necessary. Once the audit team has gained an understanding of the board's operations, then the next step is to test compliance with the adopted policies and procedures that are in place. This process includes determining a threshold called financial statement materiality. Since every transaction cannot be examined, we structure our testing based on where we determine the greatest risk are and on amounts that we consider to be significant to the Board of Public Education's financial statements. As mentioned, we also audit the individual schools. A staff member of the Finance Department carries out some of the audit procedures for the individual schools. We review that work and also conduct interviews at several schools each year on a rotating basis. The goal is the same as with the central office, to be able to determine if the policies, policies and procedures that are in place are operating as intended and determining that the internal controls and segregation of duties are adequate and operating effectively. We determined that the internal control and the segregation of duties, both at the central office and at the individual school level, have been appropriately designed and are generally operating as intended. Also, as a I have reported to the board previously, we were required to conduct an audit of the board's federal and state financial assistance. We were required to rotate which programs that are looked at each year. We verified that the internal controls and segregation of duties over federal and state awards are in place and operating effectively. And we test selected programs for compliance with the requirements for each program as set forth by various government agencies in the Department of Public Instruction. I'd like to review some financial numbers from the report with you, um, starting with the governmental funds, revenues, and expenditures, which are presented in Exhibit 4 in your report on pages 17 and 18. Um, these governmental funds include all of your fund, operating funds, 
except for the enterprise funds, which are child nutrition and child care fund. For the 2021 year end, you had total revenues of 134.6 million, which is a decrease of almost 22 million from the previous year. But that was a direct result of the completion of the Edneyville Elementary Construction Project in the 2020 year. Excluding that capital project, your total revenues increased by 4% in comparison to the previous year. And more than 21% of your total governmental funds revenue is in the local fund. And more than 73% is from state public school and federal grants fund with the remaining amount in other restricted individual schools and capital outlay funds. This next display presents information also detailed in Exhibit 4 on pages 17 and 18. In comparing these exhibits with prior year amounts, revenues in the general or local current expense fund increased by roughly 923,000 from 2019 to 2020, and then by another 495,000 from 2020 to 2021. Special revenue funds reflect an increase of 1.6 million from two years ago, and then an increase of 3.9 million or 3.9% for the most recent year in. Capital project funds revenue reflect the, the large increase going from 2019 to 2020 for the completion of the construction project and then dropping back down in the 2021 year. This slide details the breakdown of your governmental fund revenues for the 2021 year into the major revenue sources. As you can see, 66.1% comes from the state of North Carolina, 23.1% from Henderson County, 8.4% from federal sources, 1.2% at the individual school level, and the remaining 1.2% in miscellaneous revenue sources. On the expenditure side, you had total expenditures in the governmental funds of 130.7 million for the 2021 year, compared to almost 156 million the previous year. It's a decrease of 16.1%. By excluding the $27 million construction project, then there was a 1.5% increase in governmental funds expenditures in comparison to the previous year. And breakdown of those expenditures, 80.2% are reflected in, in, in instructional services, 16.1% in system-wide support services, 1.1% in debt service and capital outlay, and 1.9% in ancillary and non-program charges. This display presents an expenditure comparison for the past three fiscal years. General fund ex expenditures decreased by 215,000 from 2019 to 2020, and then were 1.45 million less in the 2021 year than the previous year. This decrease, along with an increase in revenue, resulted in an almost $2.5 million surplus in the local or general fund for the year, leading to an overall increase in fund balance. Special revenue expenditures have increased in each of the three years presented, and capital projects expenditures increased in the previous, in the prior year and then decreased in the 2021 year. This slide provides a breakdown of your governmental fund expenditures by functional type as presented in pages 17 and 18. As noted earlier, instructional services make up 80.2% of total governmental fund spending. 16.1% is in system-wide support with the rest in debt service and capital outlay and the ancillary and non-program charges. This is a presentation related to Exhibit 5 on pages 20 and 21 that pre presents your annually budgeted special revenue fund expenditures compared to budget. As you can see in, in all of the areas, the board and management performed under budget on expenditures, which can, is a sign of continuing to maintain good fiscal control and managing the budget for all funds. Now, dealing with the general fund fund balance, 
Total general fund fund balance stood at 5.4 million as of June 2021. This is an increase of two and a half million dollars compared to the 2020 year, a combined increase of more than 2.7 million over the last five years. 5.1 million of this fund balance is unrestricted and unassigned, which represents an increase of 2.6 million in comparison to the 2020 year. And your unrestricted and unassigned fund balance is 19% of your total general fund expenditures for the 2021 year, which reflects an increase of more than 10% compared to the 2020 amount of 8.8%. The unrestricted and unassigned amounts in fund balance are, reflect, are a reflection of sound fiscal management by both management and the board. This slide exhibits the allocation of your general fund balance for the current year and the previous two years, showing the amount that's restricted and assigned versus the unrestricted and unassigned. As you can see in 2019, you were at 2.3 million of unrestricted, which rose to almost 2.5 million in 2020, and now stands at 5.1 million at the end of 2021. Enterprise funds are considered business type activities and are financed in a whole or in part by fees charged. Your enterprise funds are your school food service fund and child care fund. Your school food service fund had an unrestricted reserve of a little more than two and a half million at June 30, 2021, which is a decrease of 16 and a half thousand compared to the prior year. The child care fund, which had been decreasing consistently over the last few years, actually had a healthy increase has been reported to you before. Um, that unrestricted reserve at the end of June stood at 525,000 which was an increase of 228,000 compared to the previous year. The audit results um, that we've reported is an unmodified audit opinion, it means that the financial statements that are presented in your report, in our opinion, are a fair presentation of the board's financial standing at June 30, 2021 and for the year ended. We had no significant audit adjustments, so what's been reported to you by Mr. Sosha each month is consistent with what's being reported in the audit report. And as far as the single audit with compliance, we had no, no audit findings or question costs. As mentioned earlier, based on our analysis and audit procedures, we determined that the internal controls and segregation of financial duties have been designed effectively and appear to be operating as intended. In our recommendation letter to the board, we did highlight an area where we believe that some improvement can be made in operating efficiency related to the reconciliation of certain accounts in the school food service fund. On behalf of my firm, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide our services to the board. I'd like to express my thanks to management and staff, particularly Dr. Bryant, Mr. Sosha, and the administrative and finance staffs for their expertise and cooperations. Be happy to answer any questions. Well, the question: Should we keep Mr. Sosha there? Or? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Mr. Sosha has done a, a great job, and I think you can see that in the amount of our fund balance this year, and, and, and both our enterprise and our regular fund balance. Um, so keep up the good work. Any other questions, um, comments from our board about the audit? We want to thank you and your firm for all that you do. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Sosha, you want to add anything to it or are you good to go? I am good, thank you. All right. <laughs> May I add one thing just to echo what you just said, Mr. Craven? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, uh, our partnership and, and support by Carlin and Anderson, they have been a trusted audit partner for some time for this board and for the school system. And we're grateful for that work and grateful for the, the professionalism with which they do. Uh, but each year, this is an opportunity to truly highlight the outstanding work of our finance department, our finance team, and as you mentioned, Mr. Sosha's leadership of that work. Um, the integrity, the credibility, the character, and of course, the um, attentiveness to every penny uh, that is public funds and the school system is something that we take very seriously. And we're very grateful to him and his leadership in that respect. Absolutely. Yes, sir. 
Moving on, um, next new business C is going to be naming the. Um, oh yeah, you're going to need a motion, Blair. Um, <laughs> I'll take a motion. I move that the Henderson County Board of Public Education approve the financial statements and independent auditors report as of June 30th, 2021, and for the fiscal year then ended. There's a second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Approved. Now, I can move on to naming of school facilities. Dr. John Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Craven and members of the board. And, and I, I want to, uh, Mr. Bridges, I believe, asked a question about this last time. So it's a perfect segue for us to uh, continue, continue the discussion and the opportunity. This board has received uh, considerable interest in the recognition of Mr. Tom Orr. Mr. Orr was an exceptional member of our educational community, a board member, a leader in our community, uh, someone who taught and served with absolute grace. And through that continued process and dialogue, the board gave me direction to engage stakeholders and stakeholder input about an appropriate way in which we might recognize Mr. Orr's contribution. And so today it really is my honor to bring to you a specific request in line with our uh, board policies as it relates to an honor for Mr. Tom Orr, a recognition that would provide the stage in the auditorium of Hendersonville High School to be named in his honor. You can see here uh, the Hendersonville High School Auditorium is a place of very special tradition. It is central to so many of the programs, the activities, and really what it means to be an alumni of Hendersonville High School and certainly a student during that period of time. And so as the board gives consideration to recognize the stage in his honor means every time in every activity in every moment someone's on the boards, as they say in the theater, will be honoring and recognizing his contributions and service. And so again, I bring this recommendation to you today after much discussion, much deliberation, much input from community members, alumni, stakeholders, staff, staff administration, and district leadership and welcome uh, any question and the input that the board would have to that end. Thank you, sir. Questions? I think this is long due and long overdue and, and I'm happy um, that we can, um, as an alumnus of HHS, that we can name this in his honor um, and that we will be uh, performing on the Tom Moore stage. Anybody else? No? All right, I'll accept a motion. I move that the Henderson County Board of Public Education approve the naming of Hendersonville High School Auditorium stage in honor of Mr. Tom Orr as presented. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It, it's approved. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. Next up, um, we have done, uh, we've done Return to Learn. Um, we have, and with your permission, I'd like to change the order and give uh, Mr. Rhodes, who's going to be doing the child care services update, let him go first. Gotcha. I'd like for him to be able to be a father tonight. His right. son has a baseball game. So I've got gonna, one at 530. That's so, right. Uh, we're going to give him the, you know, we talk about family first. Um, yep. and that's something that applies even in this space, especially to the, the father of a senior in high school this year. So he's going to share with you child services, and then we're going to dismiss him from the room. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before I before I go over the child care grant information, I do really want to take this opportunity to to affirm Rick Fender. You know, very few times do we get this opportunity, but a couple of months ago I was just kidding around about asking Rick to come up here and speak, and I think I run him into retirement. Uh, you know, you spoke of family. I wish you could spend time with us and our leadership team meetings on Monday mornings, especially at the end. You really would know what family is, and the appreciation of this group is just cannot be said enough. But Rick, you're going to be missed. So with that, getting off the negative news, we're going to talk about some good news. I told you last month I had some good information and some good news to bring to the board, so I'm looking forward to this opportunity. So I want to talk to you this, uh, this evening about the North Carolina Child Care Stabilization Grant. And I want to talk to you about what is the purpose of this grant. Well, this grant is funding that is part of the 2021 American Rescue Plan Act, and it's intended to support working families by providing access to high quality, affordable child care. So who is eligible to receive these grants? Any licensed private for profit and not for profit child care programs, which we do qualify. 
And so what are some of the allowable expenses for this money? So the allowable expenses are wages and benefits, staff bonuses, child care scholarships, rent, utilities and insurance, facility maintenance and or improvements, <clears throat> excuse me, PPEs, equipment related to COVID-19, goods to continue the child care program, and also mental health support for staff and children. So when can we uh, expect to receive these grant dollars? So between November of 2021 and June 30th of 2023, we are expected to receive six quarterly installments. And I'm happy to report that each one of these childcare sites are gonna receive a dollar amount based on the enrollment at that site. Up to this point, we have already received two installments totaling $1.4 million as of January 31st, 2022. And we are expecting to receive a total of $4.2 million by the end of June 30th, 2023. Wow, yes, that is a good way to describe that. So what are some of the recommendations that our leadership team would like to bring to you this evening? So one of the things that I want to remind you is that the uh, uh, wages and benefits have increased substantially over this past year and again next year. So we went to $13 an hour for this year, and then it's going to be $15 an hour next year. So one of the things that we would like to be able to do is make a recommendation that we keep our child care rates at their current levels for the next year. We would also like to look at upgrading all of our playgrounds at all 13 elementary school sites. One of the things that I would want you to know is that we have one elementary school, Upward Elementary, who during the day, the uh, playground is able to be used, but it does not meet the standards of the child care program, and it hasn't been used for over 15 years. So for over 15 years, Upward Elementary, the PSPM program, has not been able to use their playground. But by improving and upgrading all 13 of our existing playgrounds, this will benefit not only our PSPM students, but all the students at that school as well. We would also like to use those grant dollars to be able to pay for wages and benefits until June 30th of 2022. That will allow us to increase our fund balance, which I'll go over with you in just a moment. So when we start thinking about where we were at just a year and a half, two years ago, we were looking about the possibility of closing our child care program, and it was just really on shaky ground. Well, today, it's happy to report to you that it's on really good, stable ground, but we would also like to be able to see a fund balance of 75% of our annual operating cost, and that's just nine months of what we would consider a good fund balance for us to be able to not be put into a situation like we were in just a few years ago. And because of that 75% of our annual operating expenses, we feel that's going to create some flexibility for you as a board as well, because anything above and beyond that nine-month threshold will give you flexibility as a board to determine how you may use those dollars to be able to benefit the school district as a whole. And so I think it's always really important to go back to purpose, like what is our purpose? What was the purpose of the grant? And so I really want to point out, again, as we bring these recommendations to you about keeping the child care rates at the current levels, what's the purpose? Well, those rates continue to be affordable for our working families. And why is it important to upgrade those playgrounds? Again, it provides a high quality facilities for our child care program. And those grant dollars by using those wages will allow Henderson County Public Schools to keep those child care rates at their current levels without inc increasing cost. While at the same time creating a fund balance, again, of nine months or 75% of annual operating expenses, again, we're looking at long-term, affordable, high-quality child care for families, and then creating that board flexibility for you guys to be able to determine anything above that 75% threshold, how it may be used to benefit the students of our school system. And so really what we're asking for this evening is, again, as a reminder, all this money, if it's not spent by June 30th, 2023, then we'll have to return those dollars. So what we're asking for you this evening is really to give the blessing for two things. One, we would love to have your blessing for us to be able to keep those child care rates the same for the following year. And then also give us the opportunity to go out and search for RFQs so that we can assess the conditions at each, each site and to be able to look at about what that cost would incur 
for us to be able to move forward to, at that point to go get an RFP to move forward to uh, improving our child care playgrounds at each one of our elementary schools. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Mr. Rhodes, if I might just add for the board in the board's context, I believe it was the first time in history when Edneyville Elementary, the new facility was built recently, mm -hmm. that a playground was included in the construction cost. Historically, playgrounds at our elementary schools are fundraised by local dollars, PTOs, uh, you know, sponsorships and the like. And so that has been a burden that has been on the parents and families almost the moment the school opens. These grant dollars that, uh, as Mr. Rose shared with you, in excess of $4 million of money that was not expected as part of this relief aid would give this board the potential flexibility to do something we've never been able to do, which is to address all 13 of those locations in a high quality way and really applaud his leadership and thoughtfulness around that because that has been, again, a burden that has often been rested at the school level and the conditions of that fundraising have been dependent on the community's ability to raise that money. And this would take that burden of responsibility off. And so as he shares with you today, the idea of keeping those costs flat for at least the next year, uh, potentially two, and then second, the ability to go out to RFQ so that we could assess the conditions of each of those moving forward. Yeah, thank you for that. A couple questions. Um, one we just saw in our audit report that we've got about $525,000 in child care uh, reserves right now. What is 75%? So 75%, I'll refer that to Mr. Socia. Um, based on our current year, um, we would want to have um, about $650,000, which we currently already have more than that. Okay. The money since June 30. Um, but we would want to have that, you know, so we're going to increase pay next year, and then the following year it's $15 an hour minimum for, for every staff member, right? So I would like to make sure that we have a fund balance that covers that. Pay, yeah, I would not say today's pay. Next year, we're looking at seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, if seven fifty to a million is a more healthy fund balance for that program, because a couple years ago it, was, it got a little dicey there, yes, sir. And Mr. Craven, that's exactly the point. You know, Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Socia wanted to make sure that it was a percentage of the total operating, because that dollar figure is going to only sure. get bigger, sure. rather than you know saying, hey, we're trying to save flat. a flat number. We know that if the state increases salaries or the board changes that, that could cost more. So that would be a number that you would have to evaluate each year moving forward. Gotcha. And then next, um, you know, Ennyville's in a unique situation since we just built it um, and we actually put a playground out there. I would like for you guys, when you're doing these RFQs, to have these playgrounds, I think they're awesome, do all in like inclusive playgrounds. Because we have a lot of kids that can't use traditional playground equipment in our schools. And if we have these dollars to spend, and I know they're expensive, but it's what it's for. Let's get it. Let's use it. So thank you, Mr. Craig, for saying that, because I think the, one of the, the ambitions that we have is to make sure that we have, again, first class facilities for all of our students. So whatever we can afford through these grants, dollars to be able to do that, whether it be making sure that all of our handicapped students have access to these playgrounds, we, the sky's the limit as it, as it pertains to looking at those dollars and how they can be used. Awesome. Scott, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for your leadership in this program because you're right. And when I first, I think it was the first month I was on this board, we were talking about shutting this program down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know how important this is for our families. I really do. And and the livelihood of all, of, of all our staff members. The one, A couple of things I'd like to say, I'm all for getting our playgrounds up, up and functioning, particularly uh, if they're not um, if they're not where they need to be in order for licensed daycares to be able to use them. However, I also also want to point out that, you know, we don't we're not able to use those playgrounds every day. Some days it's rainy, too cold, snowy, whatever. I want to make sure that there is up to date um, activities and manipulatives and games and things that children are able to engage in while they're inside as well. And I know a lot of those things are consumable. It's it's constant refurbishing. And so I, I just want to make sure that we're just not putting every penny we've got into those playgrounds, that we have some things for indoor activities. As well. And Dr. Ray, I really appreciate you, you mentioning that because 
The leadership of uh, Stephanie Jones, Edney, and Sonia Hall, our two directors, uh, those ladies have just done a tremendous job. And one of the things that's not mentioned in this is that just that. Mm -hmm. There's so many of the smaller dollars that will be spent on making sure that every child care program is equipped with, just like you're talking about, everything that they need to make sure they're running that. So when you're inside, we've got manipulatives, we've got everything that they're gonna need and more. This has really given them an opportunity to really dream in ways that they've never been able to before. So that's a great point. Thank you for mentioning that. So if we, um, this year we bumped the salaries up to 13, next year it's 15. Keeping the wages the same, it's able to absorb that cost? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, and so really by looking at keeping those uh, wages and, and keeping them where they're at, but being able to keep the child care rates, this is where it's going to be a win for our families because we can keep that at least for next year. And maybe we're going to be able to come back to you and even ask to be able to do this for a second year. We don't want to, we don't want to overpromise, but at the same time, that is a goal of ours to be able to come back to you and recommend that we would be able to do that. Uh, if not, again, being able to make sure that when we bump and we make those increases to families, that we're very thoughtful about that and we give people plenty enough time to know that that's, that's coming months in advance. Okay. Any other questions? Have fun at the ball game. Thank you. I appreciate it, sir. Um, Next, we're going to do a quick ESSER update. The reason I say quick is that we are going to be um, hitting it pretty hard on Wednesday for our budget meeting. Um, and so, Dr. Bryant, take it away. Yes, yeah, sir. Really just going to draw the board's attention to slides eight and nine. Those are the most relevant for our purposes. And as Mr. Craven said, we're going to talk more about this in our workshop on Wednesday. But in short, our commitment to making sure that the board understands how those various um, allocations are being so you can see, for example, the third line on this, through the March 22 payroll, our bus driver recruitment bonus, we've now paid out just shy of $50,000. Substitute teacher bonus recruitment, just shy of $34,000. Um, when you look at the next slide here, TAs to support students, which now has uh, sunsetted $300,000. Arts education initiatives, that's continuing as it's gone out to bid. Paying extra employment coverage, $34,000. And we continue to analyze on a daily basis right now. One of the most important components of this, if, you, if you're looking at what was linked, or just that shows February, what's March is the live document here. But what you'll note on these slides is our continued... Numbers are different. Yeah. Now that, note note gotcha. the asterisk gotcha. at the bottom. What gotcha. was linked to the agenda is February's. My apologies for that. No what you're seeing right here is the March payroll information. So the numbers are different. They're more. Uh, because we 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 added we added a little bit uh, to those from our March payroll because we want to continue to show that to you. Can you, you go back month. to the bus driver because I was looking at sure. go back one. Absolutely. Okay. So we've almost doubled our efforts on both of those. Really. That's correct. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing people earning those bonuses by participating in that. We are seeing a higher substitute fill rate across the board. And so we're managing what all of those different pieces to the puzzle mean moving forward. Because what we want the board to have an opportunity to do, and I use the bus driver recruitment as an example, is if you're spending approximately $25,000 a month to make sure that all the bus driver routes are filled and you have these dollars available to you until 2024, do you want to continue this into the new year? Is it necessary to continue doing this into the new year in order that you have people being incentivized? What was approved and what we shared with you is through the remainder of this year, through June 30. So we'll be able to look at that, have some evaluative data, and have continued conversations around that. But we, we will talk much more about these particular initiatives on Wednesday morning. Glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Uh, construction update, Mr. Carr Taylor. Welcome, sir. Yes, good evening, board members. Uh, here tonight to be able to give you some updates on our construction projects that are going on throughout our district. And so keeping with tradition, again, starting with Hendersonville High School. And so here are three pictures, uh, one from each of the three full floors in Stillwell to give you some idea of the, the progress that is taking place within that building. 
Uh, we're starting with third floor because that is the, the direction where the construction company is really putting their energy. So when we look here at the third floor, you can see that the drywall work is complete, uh, the wall's been painted, uh, the ceiling grid is in place, uh, and so it is almost a finished product there on the third floor. Uh, we anticipate our maintenance department uh, being into that third floor, wa or waxing the floors there on the third floor uh, the end of this month. As we tra uh, transition to the second floor, you can see a little bit less progress there in terms of the drywall is up uh, and the start of that ceiling grid being put into place. And then the first floor is where all work will be finished once this project comes to a wrap. And so that's the one that's the least uh, along within that production. What are the floors like? Um, in the classrooms, it's the, the, the type of tile that they'll wax and the hallways are the same. When you go into the, the restrooms, then I believe it's more of like a ceramic tile finish. School tile. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yes. All right. When we uh, move outside to the stadium area, uh, when we met back in March, I believe it was just a big pile of dirt out there and some holes as well. Uh, that were, uh, The dirt has been removed uh, and a lot of the grading now is completed within that space. Uh, the next steps once the grading is complete uh, will be to really uh, lay out the track area, put in the curbing. Uh, gravel will go into that track area as well, and then the same will be true for the field uh, once that grading work is complete to where the gravel will be there. Uh, and then it will be set for the paving of the track, uh, the turf going in as well. Uh, and so those are kind of what you can anticipate over the coming months within that space. So we didn't have any huge unforeseen costs due to the water that ran under there and I guess under the building as well? So all of that's been addressed. There weren't any big issues that came up that okay. were kind of the unforeseen that I know were uh, created some worry. Yeah, well, I was scared but of what that. what <laughs> was there, they were able to address appropriately uh, and uh, all is well to this point. Great. Yes. So this next picture. Yes. As well as, uh, you know, if you, last month I showed you a picture of the auditorium here at Hendersonville High School, and it was basically just an empty space. It was hard to envision exactly what that final product was going to look like. Uh, now you can see within that month, uh, the seats are in place, curtains installed. Uh, even the change from one picture to the next, you can see the lighting is in place. Uh, two new speakers are put, mounted there at the front of the stage that you can't see in either of these pictures. Uh, so really now it's just some of the final uh, cleaning uh, and finishing touches that need to be put into that space uh, to have it ready for the end of the month when uh, the, the stage uh, lights turn on and we have students on that stage performing. Awesome. All right. Moving on to North and Apple Valley auditoriums. Again, since we last met, uh, those seats have been replaced in both auditoriums and uh, they are very close to being completely finished which means the end of this week, uh, the construction company will transition into this space. On Friday, they will begin removing the seating in uh, our boardroom. Uh, our maintenance department plans on coming in and uh, preparing the floor, painting it uh, so that it is a finished product looking as well. And then the construction company will be back in next week uh, to start installation as well in this space. So the next time we meet in here after Wednesday, uh, this will be a completed product as awesome. well. Did they get new carpet in there in Apple Valley and North? Mm, I believe that's the same carpet. Okay. Um, I'll double check. It looks pretty good. It does. Yeah, I was in North uh, last week. Apple Valley wasn't quite ready to go into, uh, and it it's amazing what, what those seats, uh, just how bright they look. Mm -hmm. It's a good-looking space. All right. Then just a quick list of all the other projects that we've got going on right now uh, through our MRTS funds. Again, we still have paving and roof replacement that will go on. I believe we have a pre-construction meeting at one of our schools for a roof replacement this week. Uh, auditorium seating I've already hit on a little bit. Uh, for the warehouse, the foundation uh, was poured there at our maintenance shop. And so now it's just waiting for the building, the, that new metal building to come in and be installed. Uh, in, for our video management as well through the MRTS funds, uh, Haynes Electric continues to pull the video uh, wiring throughout our schools. Uh, and so once all that's complete, then they'll go back in and start installing those cameras in uh, the high schools and middle schools. Uh, and then 
For East and West auditoriums, last week we had a pre-bid meeting for the sound and lighting in both of those auditoriums, and so this week we have the bid opening uh, for those two schools in that project. And then the final one, uh, we are continuing to work on looking at some ADA work within our stadiums, uh, and so bids have been completed there, and so we're looking at finalizing a contract that we can present to you on that one as well. All right, so at this time I will take any questions that you may have. I have a question about yes, the sir. auditorium. Just refresh my memory. Now, behind, on the, on the second floor, behind the new lighting or whatever controls, that's storage? I think it's new so, so, yes, there's two, two parts. One, where you see the window cutouts, uh, that, that will be storage. Uh, but during shows, yeah. they can bring the, the sound equipment out, and then that um, kind of desk area that you see there, yeah. uh, that's where the sound equipment will be kept during uh, performances. Uh -huh. And then how many seats were lost with that? Do you know? Um, I'm not sure if any were lost, but I can tell you if I can find my notes from my last OAC meeting. Did we add uh, We're looking at um, 896 seats have been installed. Uh, for the show at the end of the month, the school has requested that some that can be removed uh, be kept out. Uh, that's where the orchestra will be kept uh, for the show at the end of the month. But after the show, then those seats will be installed. I was just wondering with that configuration, I, I, I think I remember there were rows. Now there's just one? Yes, sir. I was just making sure. But the whole... Oh, up on the balcony is what you're talking about? Yes, ma'am. In front of the sound booth, yes, there is yes. one row there, and then behind that one row is uh, some additional walking area to get through from one side to the other, but uh, temporary seating could be placed there if the school needed it to be there. That used to be a big box. Yeah. You, yeah. And then, so the whole, uh, where was the, the entire school can fit into the auditorium? Yes, sir. Yes, again, be 890. Yeah, that, was the, that was the point of why yeah. we did it that way. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. I remember our target number was 900, and it yeah, was, cool. you said 896 with the ability to put more chairs in there if you want to at any given time. Okay. So it, it meets both the capacity and the demand and the enrollment for the school. Okay, cool. Thank you. I love the different colors. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it is a beautiful space. All right. Any other questions? Nope. Thanks, right. sir. You're very welcome. Have a great evening. All right, equity update, Dr. Wendy Fryer. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Removing barriers. Per your request um, that we be prepared to share with you our summer learning plans at the April board meeting, that is what I bring to you this evening. The first slides really were a recap of, of last year's summer <laughs> learning where we experienced much success and had much fun. <coughs> Love the pictures. Um, you'll remember the gains and achievements, the credits that were earned. And you'll remember that Hanover Research conducted a survey for us in which we heard from all of our stakeholders. And that has informed our work for this summer. We also asked that they um, send out a survey to staff um, closer to our start date. And I want you to see the number of respondents. 888 of our current staff members responded to this survey about what we have um, coming up this summer so that we can make it as effective as possible. Here are some of the overall themes. Um, the schedule, we knew the days last year were too long, but remember those were mandated. We had specific rules we had to follow last year. Um, so we have responded to that concern. Um, we have planned to staff at a lower teacher ratio, student to teacher ratio. And then we are um, ensuring that additional materials can be in place as needed and that additional planning time can occur. Um, I won't read all of these to you because I know you have these slides and you've had them for several days, but um, no surprise, we heard that those community partnerships were so beneficial mm -hmm. and we will have, I'm pleased to tell you, more community partners engaged this summer than last summer. Word got round, we've already sent out a save the date and are hearing from those partners. We're in beginning stages of contracts and commitments from those folks. 
more of the themes that you saw from the surveys are included um, in this anecdotal data. Um, notice the, the bullet um, next to the bottom talks about a bridge program for transitional grades, and we um, are fortunate enough to be recipients of funds um, to put that in place as well. I'll tell you just um, I'll tell you more about that in the subsequent slides. Um, here are some quotes from the uh, survey that was recently sent out to our staff. They want this year's program to be just as interactive and fun as last year, and then uh, to make sure that the community partners are in place. Excuse me, so if we shorten the day, are we still going to be able to have that experiential, experiential um, learning at some point during the day? We sure are. Okay. Yes, we Can definitely you will. Your enrollment going up? Um, we think it will be very similar to last year with the addition of some new programs. And I'll, I'll show you those programs next. Um, I'm going to flip on through these quotes because you do have those. So our goals, based upon the feedback we received, are more opportunities for students, increased community partnerships, and a shortened school day. So last year, last year you'll remember, our school day was 8 to 4. That extra hour seemed like three extra hours for students and staff alike, truly. So um, this year, we will be planning for most of our programs, an 8 to 3 day. There is an ex exception that I'll share with you in just a minute. So as um, we did last year and as we will continue to do because it is legislated, we will have a Read to Achieve camp for grades um, one through three um, for students um, described here. And that's not new. That's something we've been doing and we'll continue to do that. And it becomes a part of our um, elementary summer learning larger program. Summer learning K-8. These will be um, staffed at approximately 15 students per staff member, extra support for academic skills each day. In most cases, that core academic content occurs in the morning, and then our community partners fold in in the afternoons. In most cases, we have a few community partners who need to flip it, and we, of course, make concessions for those because they're, it's just that important to have them. Um, we will have 19 student days. Remember last year we had 22 student days, and these will be the dates that we will be in session. Our principals, um, as we were in the beginning planning stages, our principals said, um, let's try to conclude our summer learning programs at the end of July so that then we can flip our, our buildings and begin getting them ready for, for next school year. Summer learning 9 through 12, again, similar to last year's model, it will be a credit recovery model. We will be using Edmentum and um, teachers of record who are qualified in those program areas. It will be 10 student days and it will be half days. We learned uh, very quickly last year that full days were not um, appropriate for this model, and we didn't need the entire time. So this is what we have in place for this year. One of the new programs that I'm pleased to share with you is for students who principals anticipate have a harder time than many making that transition from fifth to sixth and from eighth to ninth grades, we will have the Summer Bridge program. It will be 50 from each um, elementary, there will be 50 students at each middle school and 25 at each high school. They'll get an opportunity not only to participate in some fun and um, academically enriching STEM activities, but they're also going to begin developing relationships with staff at the schools where they will be attending. We will make sure that they have some school swag. If they're going to be um, starting at East Henderson High School next year, we're gonna make sure they can start that school year with a green t-shirt that says Eagle Pride and, and do the same for all of our schools because we feel that that is very important. Um, our principals will be uh, crucial in helping us identify which students would benefit most from these programs. And then the other new program I want to tell you about is um, the Career Accelerator. This is designed for rising 8th, 9th, and 10th graders. Students, these students will get a deeper dive into different career pathways 
exploring them, looking at labor market statistics so they know where those viable careers are, those high wage, high skill, high demand careers that we know will lead to employment for them. But they'll also have an opportunity just to sharpen their employability skills. You heard Brittany Brady earlier share with us about how important it is for students to be prepared for the workforce. So we will also be highlighting uh, some of those uh, labor market skills. And um, the other thing I wanted to tell you about this program is they, our students will be taken on field trips to community sites, um, business and industry, so they can see some of those places firsthand. And then also we hope to be able to um, get them on the community college campus as well. So a hands-on um, program for 15 students per high school attendance zone. And again, our principals will help us identify which students could benefit most. Again, we will be offering an EC summer program for um, students who would not be appropriately supported in our other summer learning programs. It's going to be a busy, busy summer. We hope to serve as many students or more because the number of programs we have is expanding as well. Just some reminders from last year. I can't see enough of these. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. And you are going to be having transportation to get them to and from school. Yes, ma'am. Um, so what happens if we have a working parent that doesn't get off until 5? Will we have PSPM at those schools? How does that work? So I can't answer that definitively today, but I can assure you that's something that we're talking about in leadership team meetings, what opportunities we can make available, because if we can, we certainly will. Mm -hmm. okay. So in the elementary schools, well, in all the schools, with the exception of that last program, those um, students will go to their current school, the school they go to during the year for these programs, correct? That's correct. They'll be at all of our sites. Yes, okay, thanks great. for that clarification. And will you start recruiting teachers for the summer teaching? That's next. So hopefully within the next few weeks, we'll begin doing that. I was very encouraged from the response rate of our survey. And then of those who responded, 65% said they already felt confident that they would be willing to nice. work summer learning. That's yeah. Good. Especially with this time, it's 8 to 12, not 8 to 4. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. you all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sosha, some financial statements there. All righty. We'll skip from the 21 22 to the 21 20 or 2021 to 21 22 year. And I want to make sure Stephanie gets this right in the minutes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for all your time here, your time in finance, and even when you left us to go to administration. <laughs> sure. We were offering a better signing bonus for administrative <laughs> services. Stand up desk. <laughs> I think that was a look that she didn't see that. <laughs> and likewise, thank you to Mr. Fender. We'll miss having you sitting here with us in all these meetings. <laughs> all these meetings. <laughs> <laughs> On to financials. <laughs> um, two for you this month. Um, local current expense and other restricted funds um, at the end of March for the, through the third quarter. Our revenues are 28744000 and expenditures at 21502000 Just as a point of reference for you, so that was like a large balance, that's 65% of the um, annual budget, uh, which is higher than last year, which is only 60%, but is more in line with our normal operations. Um, and we anticipate a year that will use up um, the entirety of the budget this year. Um, and another note I put in the, the report, but I want to mention it. For all of our staff, April will be the first month that they will see a regular paycheck this year because of all the changes, the late time that the budget came. It, the good part was there were bonuses mixed in the middle there, but this will be the first month that everyone is going to see a regular, their normal pay for the year, and it's April. <laughs> With, for April and May, they will see a normal paycheck. Um, we look forward to next year, starting out in August when school starts yeah. with a normal paycheck for everyone. <laughs> nice to have a budget from the state. That will be much better for everyone. Um, also, having here is the capital outlay fund. Um, 
revenues through the third quarter at one million five hundred seventy-seven thousand, and or, um, expenditures now at seven hundred thirty-nine thousand. This last quarter, we spent just about two hundred twenty thousand. Work done here in the boardroom with our school auditorium seating, as um, you saw the pictures of earlier, as well as beginning some ADA seating renovations at the stadiums. And we did spend more on furniture and the instruments um, from the allocation that we put into the capital budget for this year. And I'll take any questions if you have any. Questions? All right, we'll see you Wednesday. Yes, sir. See you Wednesday. Um, you. And to wrap us up, Dr. Bryant, General Operations. Thank you, Mr. Craven. Just a couple of reminders. Again, we do have our budget workshop, which has been referenced a couple of times. That is Wednesday <laughs> morning, 9 to 12. Uh, so we'll spend some time. You have the full slide deck related to that presentation. It was sent to you earlier today by Ms. Alfrey. If you have any questions or anything you'd like us to be able to speak further to, as is always the case, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Remembering, again, we will have a working lunch. Lunch is going to be provided once again by Mrs. Alfrey, making sure she takes care of you guys on Wednesday uh, before our special called meeting in the afternoon. Another reminder, other than the dates you see here, this week, no school for students on Friday, no school for students on Monday, and if you're on the flex calendar, no school for students on Thursday as well this week. So this used to be the week that our traditional spring break would fall, remembering as we made the modification to our calendars and we designated it as the third week of March each and every year moving forward. We have these work days associated with essentially uh, th this more traditional part of spring break. So no school for students at that period of time. And then, of course, pay special attention to this is the time of year when we start to ramp up a variety of different activities and celebrations. As April comes to a close where we have our education celebration and our Hall of Fame inductees, May really is a chance for us to celebrate our students one day after another, whether it is an honor luncheon, a recognition, an evening activity or otherwise and then our school graduations that will occur on June 3rd. So it's a pretty exciting time in the school year. It really does. Spring uh, is met with much celebration and recognition for our students. So we look forward to seeing everybody on Wednesday. Absolutely. I will take a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 You're adjourned. <laughs>